this morning as we begin. Father, we invite you into this place. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being our helper and for giving us strength today. We ask that you bring peace, comfort, and healing to those that are hurting. Father, we trust you in every situation of our lives. Father, you are good, you are faithful, and your word says that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Father, we ask for your strength in this moment, and we ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 You know, in times like, like these, it can, there can be a lot of uncertainty, there can be many questions, uh, a lot of unanswered questions as to why something like this had to happen or where do we go from here. And it's in times like these that I personally have only one place that I turn to, and that place is the Word of God. The Bible says that in the book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon writes this book toward the end of his life. The Bible says that King Solomon was one of the wisest and richest kings on the earth. And he talks about his life's journey and his search for the meaning of life. In Ecclesiastes, it says that, that there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. And although the passage describes many seasons in life and the different meanings, there are just a few that we're going to reflect upon today that in doing so, I believe, is going to be very, very helpful. So Solomon describes in chapter 3, verse 1, he says that there is a time to be born and a time to die. And the truth is that all of us have an arrival time and a departure time from this earth. The Apostle Paul said at the end of his life in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 6, he said, the time of my departure is at hand. And this is the reality of humanity. There is a time to be born and there is a time to die. Cynthia arrived on March 13, 1968, and she departed May 21st, 2012. And according to the Bible, this is what I know about the departure of a believer. Paul said in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 21, he said, to die is gain, and to depart and be with Christ is far, far better. We can be confident in this one truth, that death is not the end. Death is not defeat. 1 Corinthians 15.54 says that death is swallowed up in victory. It's the reason why in the Bible you'll find that death itself is asked two specific questions when it comes to the life of a believer. The first question is, where death is your victory? You see, death gets no victory when a believer dies. Because the Bible says that death is turned into victory. The second question is, where death is your sting or your power to hurt? You see, death cannot hurt a believer of the Most High God. Death is just the believer's transition to be with Christ. It's the reason why Paul said himself to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. There is a time to be born and there is a time to die. And to be where Cynthia is today is much, much better. The Bible also tells us that there is a time to weep, that there is a time to grieve. And here's what we need to understand. It's okay to cry. It's absolutely okay to express that deep hurt that we're feeling on the inside. The Bible helps us with this. It says that we need to do this. It's, it's part of the healing process, in fact. The Bible says to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. In one aspect, we're here to, to rejoice and celebrate the life of Cynthia. But in another aspect, the reality is that there is real pain and that there is real sorrow. And this is certainly a time to weep. Solomon goes on to say that there is a time to heal. Now this is very important for all of us that are in this room today. This is good news for everyone who is broken, everyone who feels confused, anyone who is hurting. 
and overwhelmed with grief. It may take time, but here's what I know. God is always faithful to heal. And there is a time to heal. And I believe that this is the time for healing to take place. And I speak healing over every person in this room today. And it also says that there is a time to remember, a time to reflect. And it's important to remember Cynthia for who she was and more importantly, how she would want to be remembered. So it's at this time we'd like to invent, uh, invite Sam Diaz to the podium, please. First of all, I just want to say it's very nice to see everybody here, all my family, a lot of great friends. Cindy would be really happy to see everybody together here. You know, when you, when you, uh, when you come from a large, close-knit family like mine, your cousins aren't just your cousins. They're your brothers and your sisters. They're your first friends, the people that you grow up with and you share all of your childhood memories with. And when you come from a family like mine, where cousins number in the dozens, you tend to form special bonds with the ones who are closest to you in age. And Cindy was just 33 days old when I was born. And from day one, she was my number one sidekick in this family. And my partner among the dozens of cousins who are always around for birthday parties, holidays, and even just random Sunday afternoons at my grandma's house. Now, out of all my cousins, Cindy and I, we had a special bond. I remember Cindy as just a little kid, you know, those, um, those cute little pigtails might have looked like she was a dainty little girl, but don't be mistaken. Cindy was as rough and tumble as they come. Every year, every year we'd go out to Roding Park for the big fishing derby. Every year, every year my dear Lancho would tell her, Cindy, don't get too close to the water. Every year, Cindy fell in the water. Every year. You know, she was tough scrapes and cuts and bruises and stuff, they didn't bother her. I remember one time Cindy ended up on crutches because uh, she and a friend were walking to the store. They didn't want to walk all the way around the block. So they jumped over a fence, glass bottle on the other side, Cindy's on crutches. <laughs> but, you know, the crutches were supposed to slow her down. Didn't happen, she just learned to hobble around on them. She was also pretty resourceful. She had a way of getting things done, but always on her terms and definitely within her budget. One time she called me up, she was getting ready to move to a new apartment, and I had a pickup. She calls me and she says, uh, now Sam, I need you to come help me move. So I go over there and I walk in and no boxes. And I look in the kitchen and it looks like she'd just gone on some sort of grocery shopping spree. She packed her whole kitchen in Bond's plastic bags. <laughs> and we moved. She unpacked like it was just groceries, like she'd gone to Bond's. And Cindy had her fears too. Um, I, I've called her a chicken for years because she never would get on an airplane. Nope. I would tell her, you can get to Vegas in an hour on an airplane. She's like, well, I could drive six and be there at the same place. <laughs> Don't you want to see the beach, Waikiki Beach in Hawaii? You've got to get on a plane to go there. Nah, my brother lives near San Diego at the beach. I could just go there. <laughs> you know, I'd like to believe that there's a soundtrack for everyone's life. You know, for, much as a, for as much as a familiar place or an event might bring back the memories of Cindy, it was the music, the songs of her life that really tell the best stories. She loved music. As a teenager in the 80s, she was in love with those boys from Duran Duran. Yeah. She had their faces plastered all over her bedroom walls. Yeah. She would play the radio, dance around in her room, sing along. Hey Mickey, you're so fine. You're so fine, you blow my mind. Hey Mickey, 
<laughs> so for those of you that know that song and remember that video, I think Cindy actually thought that she was one of those cheerleaders in that video. And I remember one time she had her heart broken by a teenage crush. She locked herself in, in her room and she cried as she played the Bard songs over and over and over. She was a rocker too though. She and I shared a love for that 80s style fist pumping, guitar wailing, heavy metal sound. Scorpions, Motley Crue, Poison. One time she talked me into the Russian stage at Salon Arena so we could get up close to see our favorite band, Rat. But the crowd up on the stage got really out of control really fast and then literally lifted us up off our feet. We were all in the middle of it there. And then some girl tried to catch her balance and push Cindy. No, no, no. <laughs> That was it. Cindy so had enough with the crowd being in the center there. She shoved that girl out of the way and she grabbed my head and said, let's go. And she cleared a path for us, pushing people out of the way the whole way. We never rushed the stage again. We just chilled with Cecil and Greg up in the seats. <laughs> and as much as Cindy loved music, I think she loved her money a little bit more because she would not pay for music. <laughs> Cindy, I think, holds some sort of record for winning the most concert tickets from any radio station ever. I swear she was always caller number 96. And they had a dial phone. In fact, one time, she broke the phone so that she could win tickets faster. I know I'm aging myself here, but you know, back in the day, you turn the little wheel and it would turn back by itself. Nah, Cindy broke that little wheel. And that way she could just do it herself. <laughs> I would go out to Tower Records and I'd buy records and tapes, play some music. Cindy popped a blank VHS into the VCR, recorded videos, and that's how she cleaned house. <laughs> you know, when I, uh, when I heard that she'd been diagnosed with cancer, I worried about how she was taking the news. You know, was she breaking down in tears? Was she afraid of the treatments, what they do to her body? You know, when we finally talked, she wasn't any of those things. She was optimistic. She was ready for those treatments. She knew the odds were against her, but she really didn't care. The doctors gave her some hope. And she clung to it, knowing that if there was even a remote chance that she could beat this thing, she was going to do everything she could to do just that. But that was typical Cindy. No matter what, no matter where, no matter who was around, she was always just Cindy. True to herself, true to her family, and true to her friends. With Cindy, it was what you see is what you get. And cancer wasn't going to change that. She was open and honest about the challenges that were ahead of her. And she knew that she wasn't in it alone. She knew that she had the love, support, and prayer of her family and her friends. You know, when, uh, when someone dies from cancer, people often refer to it as losing the battle. But Cindy didn't lose. She won. She was determined to live her life to the fullest, to keep charging ahead from one day to the next, even when it became clear that the treatments were just buying her some time. I don't really recall her ever feeling sorry for herself or falling into some sort of depression about what was to come. Yeah, the, the treatments, they were up on her body, and they would force her to stay down and get some rest. But there was no way that cancer, chemotherapy, or anything else was gonna keep Cindy from going to Key Sweat on Saturday night. <laughs> she went to Usher, she went up to Chichanty, out to the Cherry Auction on Sunday mornings. Even just a couple of weeks ago, we talked about going to see a new edition in Van Halen this summer. I'm in, cuz, let's go. That's what she said. A few months ago, I took a day trip to Fresno to come and see her. I wanted to take her to lunch, spend a few hours just me and her so we could talk. You know, we talked about a lot of things, and, and then we started talking about cancer. And she literally got a napkin at the restaurant, and she drew a picture for me to show me where the cancer was shrinking and, and where it was growing. She told me about the treatments, she told me about the bad days she had. We, we talked about death. 
And she didn't know if she had weeks or months or years. But she knew it was coming. And while she wasn't looking forward to it, she really didn't seem to be afraid of it. In fact, she was actually more worried about how her family was going to take care of all that and handle it. She was more concerned about her girls and her husband, her mom, her sisters, her brother, nieces and nephews and cousins and all the friends. As we sat there and talked, she actually never really even shed a tear. I am. Um, I spent a few hours by her side on Sunday when it was clear to everybody, herself included, that the end was near. She knew we were there. She could hear us. She nodded her head and shook her finger. And she reached out and grabbed people's hands as they came to see her. She knew everything we were saying. You know, at one point I asked her if she wanted to play some music for her. I knew she loved music, but she shook her head and said no. I was trying to keep the mood a little light. So I told her, well then, I guess I'm just going to have to sing to you. Oh. She rolled her eyes, she opened her eyes, she rolled her eyes, she got out a little bit of a laugh. Clearly, Cindy had heard me sing before. <laughs> she knew it wouldn't be great. I already was my cousin Zip. I already miss my cousin Cindy. There's no one else like her. And as much as I would love to hear her just one more time, what up, cuz? <laughs> I know she's gone to a better place. I know she's gone to a place now where there are no more treatments, no more bad days, no more cancer. Rest in peace, Cindy. We'll miss you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for sharing those beautiful memories. At this time, the family would like to give an open invitation uh, to those of you who would like to briefly share your memories of Cynthia. So uh, if any of you would like to do that, you are welcome to the podium at this time. traveled to be here today and all the friends who've come to pay respects, thank you. Cindy once told me, cuz, there's nothing more important in life than family. No matter what happens in life, there will always be, we will always be with each other. And no matter how big of a problem comes at us, we will always be by each other's sides. As I look around the room, she was right. She knew how to make someone feel loved in any situation no matter what it was. Dude, you will always be missed and never forgotten. I just got two more words for you. Go Niners. <laughs> yeah.